NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're ushering in a new era of Locked On NHL Tuesday edition of the show. Uh, I'm Mike DiStefano, so I'm sticking around, but Joe DiBiase has stepped away for the Tuesday edition, but that's all right. We've got a pretty decent uh, guy filling in for him, Tyler Kuehl. And Tyler Kuehl is also our Locked On Locked On Caps host, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, Locked On Caps host, and uh, he's going to be joining me each and every Tuesday, joining you, the listeners, as well. Uh, so thanks so much for uh, for making Locked On NHL part of your daily listening routine. You could uh, go and subscribe to Locked On NHL, wherever you get your podcast from. Make it your first listen of the day. Once again, I'm Mike DiStefano with Tyler Kuehl. Um, lots of stuff going on in the, in the NHL right now. Uh, lots of stuff to get to, obviously. COVID, you can't run from it. You want to, but you just can't. It, it's it's all over the place, and uh, there's lots and lots of news. Seems like things are changing by the hour uh, when it comes to COVID in the NHL. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of touch on some of the latest news and the latest teams that have been placed on shutdown, whether or not uh, the Olympics are, if there's even a small, slight chance, which – I don't think there is, but we will talk about it and uh, explain some other stuff going on. A couple of positive stories coming out of these dark, dark times, uh, namely Robin Leonard and Garrett Sparks. We'll touch on those and uh, some non-COVID discussions. Why don't we? We're going to also do our Christmas wish list. We'll talk about a couple of teams and some things that we would uh, we would like for them if if we were fans of the team. What we would be asking for Santa. For Christmas, as uh, it is the the final Tuesday show before Christmas, and then as uh, we always do, like I said, new show in a way, but the same old stuff. We did this each and every week. We did our risers and our fallers as we guesstimate. We make good guesses as to uh, some guys who are going to rise and fall in our locked on NHL power rankings. So we've got a couple of teams uh, from the East that we think are going to. Uh, that will fit in each into each and one every one of those categories. Uh, let's get uh, let's get on with it though. Let's get right to the meat and potatoes of what's going on in the hockey world, Tyler. And it's the it's COVID versus the NHL. We've now have nine teams uh, have been officially shut down. I believe there could potentially be more coming. At least forty one games have been postponed so far. Um, what do you make of the last forty eight to seventy two hours of the hockey world? Well, Mike, it's it's I, I try to be positive as much as I can. At least I was until March of 2020. And ever since then, I've become either you call it a pessimist or a realist, whatever you want to call it with this sort of thing. And, you know, it seemed like we were in the clear, right? Like we were in we were on a good path, full buildings, crowds going crazy, no covid tests whatsoever. And then October hit Halloween hit with a sledgehammer and we're back to square one, it seems like. And it's it's something that's just not going away. Now, yes, there are nine teams, and there was another game that had just been postponed right before we started recording, and I completely Buffalo, forgot what it was. Buffalo and Columbus. Buffalo and Columbus, and then one more got tossed into the mix. Who was it? It was Pittsburgh and New Jersey. Uh, tomorrow's game has been postponed. So New Jersey then will be off for the entire Christmas break until next Monday. And the, the news that came out this past weekend and the fact that the NHL said they are not going to have a pause, they're not going to pause the season until after Christmas or until after the new year that it, I'm not necessarily shocked because of that, but I am not surprised either Mike by the, the news that came out in regards to the fact that they're not allowing any cross border games through the holiday break. And I'm pretty sure you can kind of agree with it. This is a move not just to maybe try to calm things down, but also so players aren't getting stuck in their in the countries that they're not playing yeah. in because that's been the big story as of late. Yeah, and like for example, the the Maple Leafs were uh, well, the Jets were in Washington yesterday, were they not, or were Washington in Winnipeg? They were in Winnipeg, or no, Washington was in Winnipeg. And then Winnipeg was Winnipeg stuck in Seattle or someone was stuck in Seattle. Yeah. So there's some teams that, that are kind of getting stuck a little bit here. And I know that for Toronto's sake, like they were supposed to play Seattle on Sunday. Now yeah. if they had gone over the border and played Seattle. Anybody who tested positive over there 
would not be able to come back over the border and would have to quarantine there and miss the Christmas holidays. And, you know, a, a lot of, of these guys are, are family men, right? A lot of them have kids or at the very least they have like girlfriends, wives, fiancés that they want to spend the Christmas holidays with. They don't want to spend it, you know, in a, in a hotel by themselves. Right. So it, it makes some sense uh, to do it that way, but I've heard the alternative also. I was chatting actually on my show today on TSN 1050 uh, on Leafs lunch, I was chatting with former NHLer Mike Johnson, and he said at the end of the day, though, he's somewhat surprised that the league has done this and they've caved to the players in the PA because in his view, he was – and I don't want to take him out of context here, but he kind of was like, well, it's part of the business. Like, you know, yeah. I've missed lots of, of my kids' birthdays, and I've missed, you know, big moments, milestones. It kind of comes with the gig. Um, and, and that was kind of his way of, of saying why he was actually surprised that the NHL has done this. What are your thoughts uh, about those sentiments? I get, to, I get Mike's point here because I mean, the, I remember there was the story of Carolina having to sit on the tarmac in Vancouver before they found out Sebastian Ajo and Seth Jarvis had COVID and they had to get taken off the plane or I was may not have been that severe, but they've been, had to been removed from the flight. So Carolina could fly back and those guys had to stay in Vancouver. But I, I think the reason that the NHL said just for the week, because obviously it's not like all these cases are just going to go away in a week or the, the COVID separation is going to be okay in a week. It's more or less because, Hey guys, it's Christmas. Like, I think that's the real big reason for not forcing teams to cross the border right now. Had this been January 15th, we'd still be playing normal hockey. The schedule would be as it is now having the teams to postpone games because of COVID. But since it's the holiday season, Mike, I think that's why, I mean, sometimes we think the NHL brass is sometimes a little heartless. Maybe they're showing that they have a little bit of soul with this maneuver. Maybe, Mike, I don't know. That is kind of what it seems like, isn't it? Like, yeah. I think that's more so what MJ was was talking about. Mike Johnson, he's like, you know, typically the NHL, it's a business. You got to do it. But they, they showed slight compassions. Um, where they're not going to show compassions, I think, is going to be the Olympics. I, I think that is no longer in the cards for the NHL, um, I'd expect uh, even, I mean, we're recording this Monday afternoon and it'll be coming out on Tuesday. I would be shocked if, uh, if we don't know by the time that this podcast actually reaches the public that we don't already have a decision and that that would be that the NHLers will not be participating in the Beijing Olympics. Um, and that just, to, to me, that makes sense. It, it, I, I believe that the NHL wanted to go. I believe that they would have honored uh, you know, honor their promise to the players that they would try and do what they can. But at this point, you look at the amount of games, we have 41 games, 42 games and counting at that, that now need to be postponed and replayed. And there's just not enough time to fit that into the schedule. If you bake in the Olympics like that, that's right. really the, the only time to get that little stretch back and try and get those games played could potentially be in between that Olympic break. So it's, I think that it's going to be, uh, I think there's like a 0% chance that the Olympics is in the cards now for the NHL. Yeah. It's because we all really wanted it, right? This is what everyone wanted. I remember that was part of the, the rendition of the CBA was that they're going to go to the Olympics in Beijing because of course the NHL had really tried to push for, Hockey to be spread into the, into the China market and into Asia and whatnot, East Asia. Mutually beneficial, right? Mutually right. beneficial. Yeah, good for the league, obviously, because there's a lot of people, Mike, that just don't watch hockey. You know, three out of the four years of the Olympic of the Olympic turn Olympic calendar, excuse me. So this obviously it's a big part for them. It's now, I mean, 2018 was 2018. That was you know that was hard knocks, political, whatever you want to call it, with the double IHF and the league. I get that, and the players weren't happy about it. I wasn't happy about it. I was not. I would not have been. I'm not sad that I didn't have to watch games at 12:30 in the morning in Pyeongchang, but it's okay. But this was different because the league was like, you know what, we want you to go, but it's just not safe to do so right now. Yeah. And it's not a political reason at this point. It's because of the safety of the players themselves, you know, with COVID and the Omicron variant, whether or not you want to scream and yell that it's not as more, you know, the mortality rate's not as bad. It's still a thing. It's still, players still get sick from this thing. And yeah, so I can understand why. I mean, literally trying to refresh my Twitter to see maybe it'll pop up by the time we're done recording here. But 
I mean, it just seems like it's supposed to be either today or tomorrow that the official announcement will come out. And as much as the players want to go, I think with them seeing all the, you know, a lot of their, you know, fellow country mates having to sit out this week because of the fact that their teams had to shut down a lot of, you know, nine teams, like you mentioned, I think they all get it. They all like, you know what? It stinks because a lot of them are in their prime right now. There's a lot of long list of players that miss out in 2018 as well. I think eventually, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just inevitable at this point. And I'll say this, it'll make for an interesting Olympic hockey tournament. Just unfortunately, there'll be no NHLers involved this time. Yeah, no, it's, it's not going to be. So there's going to be a bunch of guys who, you know, former NHLers who are playing in Europe or um, some guys who are playing in college potentially. You know, we'll, we'll see what they end up doing to put together these clubs. Um, if Of course, of course, the Spangler Cup team, Canada, Canada's Spangler Cup team is not out. competing this year. Yeah, because they because of the Omicron variant. So that means someone else other than Canada can win the Spangler Cup this year, the way it's gone <laughs> last few years. Holy cow. H.E. Davos is like, we can finally tie them again, guys. All right, let's go. <laughs> Even then, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens over there. But uh, yeah, it's 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 a whole mess, man. An absolute mess. Um, there's something that I wanted to chat about, actually. And, and you know, we, we keep talking about all the doom and gloom. There's a couple of positive stories that have come out uh, over the last couple of days. Not positive stories, but people making good out of a terrible situation. Uh, I'm going to exp- we'll share a couple of those stories. We'll do that in a moment. But first, let me tell you about one of today's show sponsors, and that's Boost Mobile. Uh, you listen to podcasts for the power of knowledge. You switch to Boost Mobile for the power of saving money. Get three unlimited data lines for 30 bucks a month per line and a free 5G phone when you switch so you can get the latest episodes all on one of America's largest 5G networks. More power to save. Boost Mobile. Disclaimer, free phone limited to one new customer and one per line. Additional restrictions apply. Offers coverage not available everyone or everywhere or for all phones and networks. See BoostMobile.com for details. Before, uh, before, we get, before we get too much of the good stuff, Mike, I know you want to try to get away from the doom and gloom. However, this, the Ottawa Senators tweeted out today that their precautionary reasons and sentence will not be practicing today until mm-hmm. after the Christmas break, as will the Ed- same for the Edmonton Oilers. So yes. just a little bit of an update there for those that weren't quite there. For those that were not doom scrolling on Twitter like we like to, Mike, uh, there's, the, you know, there's the latest from, from the nation's capital and the city of champions. Yeah, and uh, I... I had the assumption that this was going to come down. Uh, I know Ottawa's not playing, so there's no point in even getting right right now, I guess. But Edmonton, they're waiting on some batches to, to come back, and there's expectation that there's going to be a couple more positives within that group. So it makes sense that they're also kind of shutting things down for the next little bit. So that brings us, what, to 11 official teams that have been shut down? Yeah. It's gosh. a lot. It's a lot. I'm about to say, I'm like, isn't, isn't it just – isn't Winnipeg the only team right now in Canada? They seem to be the only team, but I mean, or, wait, no, because Toronto hasn't officially announced them yet, right? Toronto. Uh, not- no, they're they're done as well. They're done. Oh as no, well. there they are. There they are. Okay, yep. Yeah. So, so, yikes. Yeah, they might as well because they're not going to play any games. I guess just exactly. to keep the legs warm. I guess allow them to keep practicing. I mean, yeah, if they're not shut down, I suppose that gives them the opportunity to do that. Gives them a slight leg up, perhaps, especially with a new coach, implements new systems. Perhaps yeah. that could actually be a, a small benefit, a little bit of a silver lining for uh, Winnipeg's situation. Um, talking about silver linings, though, and and once again, I'm Mike DiStefano. Uh, with me is Tyler Kewell, the new host of the Tuesday edition here at Locked On NHL. If you missed Joe, I apologize. But, uh, well, unfortunately, he decided that he wanted to put some more focus onto Locked On Sends, which is he does a great job with. So. If you miss Joe, go check him out at Locked On uh, Saber. Sorry, not Centers. Locked On Sabers. Starts with an S, ends with an S. It's, it's all good. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, but like I was saying, um, you talk about silver linings. There's a couple of really, really cool stories that have come out uh, over the last couple of days, um, whether it's guys who are making some NHL debuts or haven't played in a while, or in last night's case, uh, Robin Leonard returning to the island uh, for the first time, getting a standing ovation. How cool is that to see? You know, I, I really been thinking about this because I watched a little bit of that game last night while also watching the Caps and, and Kings. And I just remember 
you know, the way Brendan Burke kind of broke it down too, because obviously they always do those during the t- first TV timeout. So the fans don't get to see it live, unfortunately. Sometimes they do. Uh, I, of course, you know, the, the big one that everyone remembers the return to Long Island back to Nassau was John Tavares. And of course, Sportsnet's like, we're keeping it here, kids. And it provided some great entertainment. The crazy part is, is that, you know, Robin Leonard, yes, he did leave Long Island, not under the same terms as John Tavares, but he left after one season. I don't know how many players, Mike, for any given franchise ever that went to a, a team for one year and made this the same kind of impact that Leonard did. You know, not just the fact that he helped that team get to the playoffs, not just the fact they made it all the way, you know, to the second round after not winning around. I mean, winning only one round when JT was there. The fact of the matter is like that was a real career turning point for Leonard, not just for not just on the ice, but for himself emotionally. Obviously, his battle with mental illness had been well documented. And he's a very outspoken advocate for it. And the city latched onto that. They felt like he was one of their guys, one of their own, even though he's only there for one season. And yeah. that's why there's still people that go to Islanders games wearing Leonard shirts or they follow Leonard, even though he's in Vegas now. It's 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 pretty it's a real cool story. And I, I think he really earned every bit of that ovation last night, even though it was his team picking up the win in a shootout. I'm pretty sure some people are still happy to see number four or in this case, number 90 back yes. there in Long Island. I, I completely, completely agree. Um, and then even like they saw, he, he had a Long Island tattoo along his neck and he kept pointing to that just as they yeah. were showing his ovation saying, Hey, you're always with me. You know, like I, I'll always appreciate my time here in Long Island to the point where he literally got art on his body of uh, a little shape of the Long Island. Um, but another cool story that happened uh, last night, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, well, I'm sure you did see it actually Garrett Sparks (laughs) yeah Garrett Sparks ended up uh in the NHL and and Garrett Sparks had an opportunity to uh to get the victory over well your Washington Capitals if I'm your Washington yeah yeah I know it that was (laughs) it was so interesting because well first of all the big story from the cap side of things going in was Joe Snively the local kid from Virginia getting his yeah. first you know first game with his local team he was a Washington little cap growing up and that was the big focus and we look on the other end there's Garrett Sparks and I'm like holy cow Garrett Sparks and I remember because of course you know you and I Mike we, we saw him play in Toronto and it did not end well at all in this time here so seeing him back in the NHL, I mean, of course was huge. And because, because he was in the ECHL last season, you yeah. know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to go full saying like, this is like a Zach Fucali story. Cause Fucali finally got his first oh, angel start this time, but sparks is having to work through it. Cause he really went into exile after he left Toronto. I mean, spent time with Chicago, you know, played in some preseason games with Vegas, but really never gotten on a shot back in the NHL. And the way he played last night, Washington really outshot LA and, you know, had it not been for that late comeback, boy, you know, the Kings would have fallen two nothing two one in that game, but he made some big saves, had to make some big stops on Ovechkin. You know, it's not, I mean, this is a guy, I mean, he looked more confident and, you know, maybe this is going to maybe uh, get our, our West coast fans out there. Maybe it's because playing in a smaller mark or a, a smaller hockey market in Los Angeles. I know it's a big sports market, but the biggest spotlight on the Kings out there. Maybe that's a little bit easier on him because playing in Toronto, Mike, you're there, you're right in the thick of it. It ain't easy. It's not an easy thing, especially for a goaltender. No, absolutely not. And, and you know, Garrett Sparks came out after the game and talked about the journey to get back into the NHL and how proud he was of, of the fact that he was able to do that. You know, his struggles, he had some concussion issues um, that he was never able to kind of work back from. Um, you know, a couple other injuries. And then, like you said, played in the ECHL a year ago, wasn't sure if he'd ever get back into the NHL. And then, you know, lo and behold, a, a couple of COVID issues arise with the Kings. And and next thing you know, Gary Sparks, Garrett Sparks gets the call and gets back into the NHL for the first time since March. Uh, it was March 19th of, of 2019 or March 20th, maybe of 2019. Yeah. So, you know, it had been, I guess almost three years since he had been uh, and played in an NHL game. And, you know, it's really nice to see, you know, kind of stories like that happen. 
Yeah, because I mean, I remember there were people like the first couple games he played last year were just screaming at Dubas, and I'm like, you let Pickard and you let McElhenney go for this guy, and <laughs> and I I was one of those people as well. It's very critical. I remember my first my first time going ever to the ACC was him playing in the game, and I'm like, yikes, he's the future of this. I mean, this was 2016 season, though. Granted, that team finished last before they drafted Austin Matthews, but I'm like, yeah, he's a good American League goaltender, but does he have what it takes to make it in the NHL? And you know what? He's shown time and again that he has it. And maybe, I mean, you know, like you said, a certain, certain of, you know, kind of victim of circumstance, but was able to get a shot. And maybe if he's able to stick around, maybe he'll get that confidence back and maybe he can meet the potential. That's what, you know, when the Leafs drafted him out of Guelph, they kind of saw this potential and maybe he'll, maybe he'll meet it. He is a little bit on the, on the other side of, in terms of being a prospect, but you never right. know if, if he, if he can step in when he can do it. Shoot. Hey, look at Jack Campbell. I mean, there's one, there's another story right there. I was just going to say another guy who ended up, you know, down the dumps, couple injuries, ends up in the ECHL and then works his way back up to the NHL and never looked back. I I don't know if Garrett Sparks can be that guy, but there are, you know, there's precedents of that happening. You know, there, there totally is. Um, Another, another kid who actually um, I just want to touch on quickly as he is part of the the Eastern Conference. So I guess it, it makes sense. It gives us an opportunity to do that. But another guy who was able to make his NHL debut and get an opportunity to to play um, through, you know, just an abundance of, of COVID issues arising within their team is Jack Drury uh, of the Carolina Hurricanes getting his opportunity to come up and play in the NHL. And he's got two goals through two games. So Jack Drury making the most of that uh, opportunity, which is just fantastic. I believe he's a son of Chris Drury, is he not? I uncle, sorry, his hmm. uncle uh, is Chris Drury, so he's the nephew of Mr. He, yeah. Drury. So I, I wonder if eventually he'll end up uh, with the Rangers. But uh, just another, you know, nice story to come out of such a dark, dark times. You know, kind of finding the silver lining is what we're trying to do here, as uh, it's it's pretty well doom and gloom for the most part around the world. Yeah. Well, and Jack's a great story, too. First of all, you know, you mentioned his Uncle Chris, who is a Hobie Baker Award winner there at Boston University. Jack decides he's going to have some fun over at Harvard, home of the Crimson. And I'm pretty sure that made him a little uneasy, did Uncle Chris there. But you know what? He 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 stepped up. I mean, like you said, COVID issues with the Canes, but this they're, they're still finding a way to win hockey games. And first game against Detroit, who is a, a no slouch right now, kids. Watch out for them right now. And he comes out and scores a goal, scores one the next game against L.A. as well. And you know what? He's It's one of those things where I don't expect him, you know, barring any other COVID issues with this hockey club, not sticking around too much with the top team. But it's kind of just showing Brendan Moore and, you know, the brass up there said, hey, whenever you need me, I'll be ready. Because if you score your first two goals in your first two games, you'll stick around for a few years. Heck, Justin Hall is still a Toronto Maple Leaf because he scored a couple goals pretty early on in his career. Yes, he did. And, uh, you know, down with the Myers, this is his first year of, of uh, pro hockey in North America. He played in the SHL last year, um, and this year was the first time playing pro in, in North America. He's got 16 points through 23 games in the AHL, and I got that call up. And, uh, hey, he's on pace uh, for goal a game. I mean, there's not many guys who uh, average He's going to be in the Rocky Richard race. Now. Put him in the rest of the season there, Rod. He's going to be 44 goals, and he'll finish behind Ovechkin and Dreisaitl for that for that mark probably. It, remi- it reminds me of of another Carolina Hurricanes guy, Morgan Geeky, who yep. got to go and he got a call up like a game, maybe it was two games, either one or two games before the initial shutdown in March of 2020. And he had like a three points in, in that one game, and it was like, oh, this guy's the next Gretzky, Morgan Geeky. Holds the record for for points per game in his career, and it was like three points in one game. And I mean, he's doing all right as like a, a depth guy for for the newly minted Seattle Kraken, but didn't quite turn into that uh, Gretzky level score that we were talking about back in oh. March of 2020. <laughs> well, it's just like hey, you want to talk about one of those. I'm pretty sure there's still some Montreal Canadiens fans that are still screaming for uh, for um, not Cole Caulfield, Ryan Paling to get a call up finally because holy cow, he comes out. Bob Cole's oh, last yeah. game ever scores the hat trick and then scores the winner in the shootout. Yeah. I mean, geez. And then unfortunately got a concussion right before training camp. But man, it, yeah, that, he's had, a, the, he's had a, a couple of chances this season. He's gotten the call up and hasn't quite lived up to that billing as well. Um, yeah. let's, uh, let's shift gears here once again, actually, before we do, you want to tell our good folks 
about uh, one of today's show sponsors, betonline.ag. Yes, sir. BetOnline has you covered all season with the best props, odds, and lines, more props, odds, and lines than ever before as the football season continues its march to the playoffs. BetOnline remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. You can head to the new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit by using the promo code Locked On to receive the bonus. From basketball, football, boxing, UFC, favorite Vegas casino games, right to the National Hockey League. Do not wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers for the 21-22 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online is where the game starts. So yes, power rankings time there, Mike. We get to determine who is good and who might be good and who yeah. is not good at all. Yes, yeah, so uh, every. Wednesday at Locked On, uh, the Locked On NHL Network puts out things in the NHL, and it is done by 32 hosts across the 32 teams in the NHL. And uh, let's talk about a team or two that we think are going to rise from last week's rankings, and a team or two that might fall in last week's rankings. I'll start. I, I and here's the problem with uh, with doing this exercise this week. Eh, a lot of teams didn't get to play a whole lot. Uh, I think it'll be it'll be harder next week because we just like nobody played. Nobody played. Next week will be just like we'll just cut and paste. Imagine, yeah, yeah, I would imagine we just don't do one next week. It's just <laughs> it's, there's no power rankings. It just stays the same. A little two week ranking. My goodness. Well, the team that I think does deserve to go up and, and the team that has played a little bit here over the course of the last uh, couple of weeks and they've been playing some solid, solid hockey is the Pittsburgh Penguins. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think the Pens need to skyrocket into the top 10. Uh, they're playing exceptional right now. I believe they're, what, 16th? I had it, and then I lost it. But I believe Four, 14th, 14th. They'd 14th. risen from 16th uh, two weeks ago to last week, yeah. And now I think they, they vault themselves even higher up in those rankings. So I, I like uh, I like Pittsburgh to be one of those teams that will rise in our power rankings. Yeah, especially the way, I mean, you look at some of the top 10 teams. I know we don't want to go too far into the West, but the way the Oilers really, I mean, I know they're pa they're in a pause right now. I understand that. But before this pause, pause, they were they were really struggling, especially when the Leafs went in there and really knocked the doors down at, at, at Rogers' place there. They really kind of looked like a team that was out of sorts. And, it, and of course, that's, when, that's what happens when your offense relies on two players. The team that I'm I'm really kind of bummed about just because the way they started, and I know it's it's almost looking like deja vu for this hockey club, staying in the Metropolitan Division, the New Jersey Devils. I mean, they had a real good start to this year. I mean, even with Jack Hughes out of the lineup, they were playing good hockey. Dawson Mercer, my goodness, the Maritimer coming in here, really showing up. Mackenzie Blackwood stepping up, realizing that he has a he honestly he would thought he was in the running to possibly be a Team Canada uh, goaltender really? the way he was playing early on. But now they've lost six straight games, and they're now all of a sudden they're below Philadelphia, who I don't want to say is turning things around, but they're playing better since they, you know, they fired head coach and Mike Yo is taking over. But the Devils have really been a disappointing team right now, and I'm, they're, they're currently sitting in 24th. And I thought they were, I mean, at one point they were out the middle of the pack, but I think they may be creeping down towards Islanders territory. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I think that's a team also that's definitely gonna gonna take a bit of a nosedive in our rankings. Like you lose six games in a row, that's tough for you to hang on, right? Like, right. it's just gonna be tough to do. Another team that uh, quietly is in a, on a, I don't even want to call it a losing stretch, but um, sub five hundred in their last ten games is the Florida Panthers, who've been up at the tippy top for quite some time, or up in the top three at least for the last three, four weeks in a row. Maybe that the Florida Panthers fall off a little bit. Not not too too far. They're not gonna fall out of the top ten by any means. Maybe not even fall out of like the top five or six. But I don't think they hold on to their ranking, especially since they're riding a three game losing streak and have only won four of the last ten games. Yeah, they're, they're an eight two beatdown by the Ottawa Senators. Yeah, that I and you can chalk a little bit up to COVID. I know they've had some issues as well, sure. and 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 every team is going to go through a stretch like this, right? Every good team has this stretch. Some did it early on in the season. Some do it right now. Some will have it late in the season and kind of go into the playoffs on a whimper. But I mean, don't look now. But you have right now a tie between the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Toronto Maple Leafs for the top spot in the Atlantic Division. 
Tampa, who was consistently third and fourth in the division. All of a sudden, Florida dupes down and whoop, there go the lightning up back towards the top. Hey, guess what, kids? The defending Stanley Cup champions are pretty darn good. I mean, it's this this team. I don't know. I don't. Do we want to put Tampa at the top of everything again, Mike? Are we are we there yet with this club? Even though you know Kucherov's out of the lineup, but it seemed like that hasn't phased them before. I mean, I, it's hard to say right now with all, especially with the cases going on right now and these pauses. It's hard to say who the truly best team is in this conference. Obviously, the Leafs have been great ever since that real sluggish start. Tampa, even with their kind of off start as well, they've picked it up as of late. Vasilevsky has been starting to play a lot better as well. I mean, this has all of a sudden become, once again, as we've usually seen in the past, the Atlantic Division's top two or three teams, the entire Metropolitan Division, and then the rest of the Atlantic. Is, is that how it's shaping up to be again? It, 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 it appears that way. I, I think it appears that way. I think so... Right now, we have up at the top of last week's rankings. So going into this week, well, the Panthers are up at the top. I expect for them to fall a little bit, um, as as I mentioned a moment ago. I think the Hurricanes are one of the top teams as well. They'll probably stick around there along with your Caps. What do you think about the Leafs? Because the Leafs, they're third. They fell from second to third last year or last uh, week. And this week, they only got to play a couple games, only got to play one game, actually, this week. And it was a win against the Edmonton Oilers. But they haven't played terrific hockey of late. Do you think they hang on to this third spot? You know, I, I really think so. Uh, you know, Minnesota, as far as we know, they're still playing. So they have a chance to maybe eclipse them. And I mean, I think the Minnesota Wild have been everyone's real surprise this year, just based on the, you know, you can say it's because of the slow start for the Colorado Avalanche and other teams in the Central Division, Dallas being a lackluster team, what have you, but they've been playing well. But Toronto, I, I, just the way they've looked as of late, you know, they just seem more and more confident in the way they've won games, the way they've beaten big, you know, better teams than them. Or teams that are, you know, in the upper echelon. Like I said, I know Edmonton's been a bit of a slide, but you go into Edmonton and you still shut down the Oilers. I mean, then again, the Leafs have been doing that, it seems like, for the last four or five years. No matter how bad the Leafs are, no matter how good the Oilers are, it just seems like no matter what, the Leafs can win in Edmonton sometimes. But, you know, the I'd say they could stay in third. The Caps, I know they're second right now, and just the way they played against L.A., the way they really kind of collapsed, and the way their power play is, and just given the fact that they've battled hard against Chicago in both of the games, and they've lost in lost an extra time in both those games, uh, it's hard to say that Washington's the second best team in this league, you know. And I know there's a lot of made my lockdown caps viewers that are tuning in here that are probably screaming at the top of their lungs at me and are asking for my head, but you know, it's 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 hard to say that they are the best team because they've looked like the best team at times. But that's the thing: it's is it the most consistent? You know, that's with a lot of these teams. That's why it's so hard to tell right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think like there's just there's a lot of parity at the top of the league, I think is is what we can kind of muster up out of this conversation is, you know, you can you could put probably four, five, maybe as many as six teams who I could see at the number one spot this week, and I wouldn't really be upset about it. Yeah, no, and that, that's like I said, Minnesota can be up there. Carolina, with the fact they've had of all the COVID issues they've had, they've still they're been winning, winning hockey games. They played with two guys short this week against Detroit. Two guys short and still went out and beat them. Yeah, and like, and to that point, once again, that's not just because of the fact that you know it's not like the Red Wings of last year, or two years ago. This is a Red Wings team that's above five hundred, and as of right now, I believe they're in a playoff spot. So, and gosh, it's. It's a hard, it's a hard league to win games in when you're fully staffed and fully stocked up. And they did it without Aho, without you know, without Pesci or Pesci was back in the lineup, but without Seth Jarvis, who's played key roles. I mean, their goaltending obviously has been much better. And I, you know, Peter Morazic's moved on and looked pretty good in the what three or four games he's played in Toronto. But you know, Freddie Anderson's found a new home there. He's looking very comfortable. That team's good. It's just another one of those things. If they get to the playoffs. And where they're at in the playoffs, how dominant are they going to look? Like that's that's the question with Carolina. Are they going to be a good regular season team and then do what Tampa did and flame out in the second round? Well, their goaltender is Freddie Anderson. So, uh, well, Freddie Anderson hasn't been to the second round since he left Anaheim. So, (laughs) so (laughs) no no one really knows how it's going to be for him. Gosh, it's been over half a decade. My my goodness, I have to I have to remind myself that. 
And you know what? But then again, let's be honest. I mean, I'm pretty sure you've talked about it just about as I have. Frankie hasn't or Freddie has not played behind a defense like this before since leaving Anaheim. I mean, I, you know, I, I love Morgan Riley and I think there's upsides with a couple of the other young defensemen there in Toronto, but Freddie's been sometimes in hung up to dry so many times. He's probably like comfortable. It's like, you know what? This is a lot nicer, a lot more comfortable. I can make a save and not have to panic about the rebound or it's not going to be a two on one every 35 seconds against me. Like that's, that's why I think he's playing more comfortable. And that's why Carolina, dare I say, might just be, I know points wise, maybe not right now, but might just be the best team looking right now in the East. I think, uh, I think I agree with you on that one. Um, that's the way that I've submitted it in as my power rankings. So uh, definitely, definitely agree. Okay. Uh, we're not going to have much time to, to go through a number of teams, but is there one team specifically, if, if they, if you had, if you're saying, to clause and they could grant you then you could grant a wish what team do you think would be asking for what am i allowed do i have to stay in the east um my goodness um i'll start man. i'll start i'll start i think if i'm like easy one easy easy one if you say montreal <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm, oh, gonna say Montreal. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with the Tampa Bay Lightning. And the easiest thing is like good health. They have been decimated. Or even the Penguins even. I'll throw the Penguins in there too. Just good health for the new year. Like just hopefully everyone can get back. Gino hasn't played a game yet. Brian Rust, you've had Latang miss some time. You've had Gensel who's out for a little bit. Crosby has missed some time. Like they've had so many players that are out. And then with Tampa Bay, you know, Kutra being out long term, you've got point out. Sorelli's been out for a little bit. I mean, COVID aside, there was just some big injuries to these two teams. Uh, I think they probably would like some uh, some some good health going forward. And I'll throw one more at you: the Toronto Maple Leafs, a top six or top four defenseman. Are you talking? Is this 2017, Joe or Mike? How how many years have you been asking for this? Since I dare I say since. I know people probably didn't think of him as a top four defenseman, but since Dion Phaneuf was traded, I mean, it's that's that's the hardest part. I think it's another one for the Leafs. Like, I I love I like I said, Justin Hall bursts on the scene, and you, we saw what his potential was, and it just like it just hasn't clicked. And the same thing with Travis Dermott. Like the list goes on of like, oh, could they and will they? And you know, Rasmus Sandin, and then he gets need, and then you know, Timothy Lilligren, and uh, he's okay. I, I can see what you're saying. It's it's hard. Just once again, the eighty-one and a half million dollar salary cap, and you have five players that are combined almost was it fifty-seven, fifty-eight million dollars between yeah, Nylander, five. Tavares, and Marner and Matthews. It's yeah, it's it's tough to do that, and I can see why. It, if I'm going to go on a Christmas list and stay away from Montreal, just because I, I, For I obvious I, reasons. It, yeah, it's so it's that that team has a laundry list of Christmas wishes to Santa Claus this year. I think namely going in a time machine and uh, probably not selecting Logan Mayu and uh, probably not going through with, with uh, Bergevin as their coach or the GM going into the year. Multiple. Yeah. I let's say it was too bad. Too bad. We're cut for time here. Cause I could really go on a long time about Mark Bergevin. And then again, I'm pretty sure the entire province of Quebec could probably go for that as well. Um, you know, if I'm looking at Boston, my my Christmas wish is just a consistent goaltender, mm -hmm. right? Linus Allmark comes in, and as soon as I heard that deal, I was like, really? Like, that just showed that Tuka Rask wasn't sure yet. But now I've, we've been hearing Tuka Rask has been skating. He's been getting back into shape. Obviously, a lot of it was hopefully towards the fact that he wanted to go to the Olympics. I don't know where that's going to stand now. Jeremy Swayman, I think, is a great goaltending prospect. I think he's going to develop into a very top-end goaltender. He was a Hobie Baker nominee for a reason while he's at the University of Maine. It's just for him right now, consistency is difficult. That's the reason why Boston is below Detroit. It's close, but they're still below Detroit in the Atlantic Division. If they have a solid goaltender in there right now, if they have Tuka Rask from two years ago, or, of course, the Halak, uh, the Halak uh, Rask, duo they had a couple years ago i think we're looking at a much different atlantic division outlook right now i think boston has even though the you know the perfection line can only go so long for i know it's only gonna be a couple more years with this group but even with all this stuff they've had they've battled they've had some tough games 
So you know what? Jake DeBrusque is on the table. What can you get for him? What kind of goaltender can you get for him? So if Santa can maneuver a deal there for Mr. Sweeney, I'm pretty sure Beantown would like that a lot. Oh, no doubt. And I mean, pff, oh, you, you may not even need to give up anything. Tukaras may be willing to come home at some point. And I think that would be pretty good stable goaltending as well. Uh, all right, that uh, that's going to that's gonna do it for us. We're running out of time a little bit here. But Tyler, you absolutely killed it. Knocked it out of the park as on your first show here as the new co-host of the Tuesday edition. Hope you had fun. And uh, hey, we'll do this again next week. Next week, same bat time, same bat channel, oh, right? Is that what they call it? That's exactly how they say it. Uh, but that's going to do it for us here today on the podcast. I'd like to thank everyone for listening and supporting the show. You'd subscribe to the Locked On NHL podcast on all podcasts and platforms and receive daily hockey content. Follow myself at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow my show at Locked On Leafs. Tyler, where can the good folks follow you on social media? At TJKU29 on Twitter, Instagram, and yes, Mikey, it's going to sound really annoying, but I am on TikTok. I actually post, oh. I know it's not just all dances and dumb stuff, but there is my dog. My dog's cute. Of course, I put her on there, but also I do some fun little hockey stuff. I did a, a cool little bit about talking about the NHL arenas that are being played in that still have their original name. And uh, guess what? It's a higher number than what Gil Martin thought, but it's still a very small number. So I did a little fun little thing on that. So it's not just stupid little dances. It's actual good learning experiences for the folks. Like four? No. Gosh, why is it? Man, I I will say it is bigger than I thought. Now, granted, you'd be right. But then again, I'd say nine of them were built. So the answer is actually 10. But eight of them were built within the last in this millennium. And I think five of them were built in the last three years. So, okay. Including right. UBS Arena. We're going to have to check. We're going to have to check out. Wait, what? Well, well, yeah. Yeah, no, 10. So there's, are you talking about like how many there Seattle's, are? Seattle's building. Seattle, no, Seattle is actually not one of them because Seattle was the original, the old key arena uh, or not the, uh, not key arena. Um, I forget what it was called, but it, it's revamped, but it's the, still the same arena. So technically Climate Pledge Arena is the oldest arena in the National Hockey League. Because it was built in 1962. They just renovated it. That's all it was. So technically, and they changed the name of it, of course. So technically, it's not even the original one. Um, But like, obviously, the Prudential Center is one. Madison Square Garden is the second oldest. That's the oldest of the bunch. Um, United Center is one. But even then, that was like the Exxon Energy Center at one point, right? No, it's still still the Exxon Energy Center in Minnesota. That has not changed. Um, the one that I was shocked that stuck around was I I it's the same because that was built like four or five years ago. Rogers Place, yep, because Ro- you, because Rogers needed another arena or a sporting venue in Canada because there's not enough of them. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's there's a couple. I mean, like I said, a few of them were built in the last few years, and I of course check it you- out on Tyler's Instagram, check or yeah. uh, TikTok, TikTok, check on my Instagram TikTok. as well. Yeah, we got to gotta run before Sean gets mad at us. <laughs> Absolutely. We're running hot here, uh, but we'll be back next Tuesday, but there will be a show tomorrow and I'm sure there'll be tons of tons of news that they'll be, uh, that they'll have to cover. That'll be going on on the Wednesday show. So be sure to uh, subscribe and check back each and every day for new content uh, for Tyler Kuehl. I'm Mike DiStefano. You've been listening to the Locked On NHL, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.